Part of the policy planning team on Euro Atlantic integration issues and Deputy Chief of Mission at Romanian Embassy in Washington, D.C. Ambassador DeCaro graduated of, uh, a graduate of Polytechnic Institute of Bucharest and has a master's degree from the University of Amsterdam. In 2005, he received his PhD in International Economics from the Academy of Economic Studies in Bucharest. We're honored to have Ambassador DeCaro with us today to give us a NATO perspective on some of the six issues that we are, uh, are the main uh, part of our program for the next year. Thank you. Please welcome Ambassador DeCaro. It is indeed a very special pleasure and honor for me to be back in uh, Washington to address such a distinguished uh, audience on a team which stands not only at the core of my current work at NATO headquarters in Brussels, where I'm currently um, I mean, as NATO ambassador and the dean of the North Atlantic Council, but which has been also an important dimension of my job. Uh, as my country's former ambassador to the United States of America. I had the privilege of serving my country in this wonderful city and country. Um, at the time when my country became a member of NATO, a relevant contributor to NATO's operation and developed the strategic partnership with the United States. Uh, and uh, I'm particularly grateful for the organizer to Corey uh, Murray and Paula Dobriansky, who is a longtime friend and whom I admire a lot for this invitation today. I'm addressing you today not only and not mainly as my uh, country's uh, envoy, but rather as a member of what we call the NATO family, a young and ambitious member of a mature and successful alliance as its past has proven, but also a future-oriented alliance. So let me start with a question which is actually the theme of my address today. What is NATO's role for the 21st century security? To address uh, this question, allow me to refer to a story attributed to uh, famous professor Albert Einstein, who at the end of an academic year, after presenting the questions for the 10 year exam, was asked by a rather meritorious student if there wasn't any mistake or confusion uh, since the questions were exactly the same as those of last year's exam. <laughs> Professor Einstein assured everyone that there was no mistake. The questions are indeed the same, he said. But this year I have changed the answers. <laughs> and uh, he went on to explain that while some key answers might indeed remain the same, a number of other important answers have changed in the meantime. So very much like uh, in the Einstein story, the generic question in front of us is unchanged. What are the most appropriate answers to national, to allied, and to international security? And while some known answers remain relevant, some new ones emerge and require implementation. In addressing the details of this question, one uh, thing comes out as extremely clear for the United States of America and for its allies, NATO, the North Atlantic Alliance, remains key and for the international community as a whole, the alliance contributions to security and stability are increasingly relevant and recognized as such. But what kind of NATO are we talking about today? It isn't, it ain't your that is NATO, many might say, and they are right. Although one should add, in all fairness, that it is uh, an alliance based on the same solid foundations that the Alliance founding fathers have established in the Washington Treaty 62 years ago. In two weeks from today, two weeks and a, uh, the new strategic concept NATO adopted at the Lisbon Summit last year will mark its one year anniversary. 
while reaffirming without any amendment the Washington Treaty. This new strategic concept is defining the alliance adaptations and response to the 21st century security challenges. The strategic concept, as well as its implementation in subsequent policies, relationships, capability developments, and actions are actually reflecting NATO's role in the 21st century. To better structure this role, I will address three relevant questions. Number one, what are the constants of NATO's role and identity? So what has not changed? Number two, what is new and what has changed? And number three, what is the way ahead? So what has not changed in NATO's role and approach? First is NATO's enduring purpose. And I quote from the strategic concept, to safeguard the freedom and security of all its members by political and military means. More precisely, it's the collective defense based on Article 5 of the Washington Treaty that remains unchallenged at the very core of the alliance. I would say the key element of these bodies, DNA. This core mission of collective defense is based on another constant of NATO identity. A unique community of values, commitment to the principles of individual liberty, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. The role of NATO as a community of values has consolidated over the 62 years of Alliance history. The addition of new members, two new members after the end of the Cold War, has extended this community of values, of solidarity and purpose. The next fundamental constant is the transatlantic link, which remains, and again I quote from the new strategic concept, as strong and as important to the preservation of the Atlantic peace and security as ever. Furthermore, this remains a consensus rule alliance where policies, actions, and operations are based on the consensual decision of all its members. The key role of the alliance, its core mission, values, its institutional construction, forged to defend and deter against threat of aggression, are constants in NATO's history. Now what has changed? The evolution of the security framework issued the need for NATO to adapt itself to this new framework. This is a continuous process. It is after all not the first time that NATO is adapting this strategic concept. I think it was Winston Churchill who said in his characteristic style that however beautiful a strategy might be, one should occasionally perform a reality check. After the Cold War, NATO adapted the strategic concept three times. In 1991, to reflect the new post-Cold War reality, a strategic concept which opened the way to partnerships and the enlargement of the alliance. Then in 1999, at the Washington 50th Anniversary Summit, in the midst of the NATO's first of the Bavaria operation in Kosovo, a time when the dilemma seemed to be uh, out of area or out of business. And recently, in 2011 at the Lisbon Summit, when the key question has been the response to the emerging security challenges. The nature of threat is in a continuous evolution. New threats and challenges that were almost inexistent or were not relevant for NATO 20 years ago are now high on our list of concerns. I include here international terrorism, the ballistic missile threat, the cyber threats, piracy, energy security challenges, to name but a few emerging and growing security challenges. So, at the core of the Lisbon um, NATO strategic concept is the development of new policies, the improvement of NATO structures and processes, working methods, as well as the building of new capabilities to answer these new and growing challenges. Furthermore, there are some completely new elements. Crisis management is defined in the new strategic concept as a new task of the Alliance. NATO is supposed to use an appropriate mix of political and military tools to help managing crises that have 
the potential to affect its security and international security as a whole. The other new element is cooperative security, which became another key task of the Alliance. This is implemented through the enhanced role of NATO partnerships, including this distinct partnership with Russia or those with Georgia and Ukraine. And I must mention here as well the importance attributed to partnerships with other organizations such as the European Union, the United Nations, in the so-called comprehensive approach framework. Existing formats or more flexible formats of partnership dialogues, the so-called 28, the number of allies, plus N, number of partners, formats, which have been already used for consultations among part participations in operations between allies and partners, can be used, determined by substance and dialogue effectiveness. Another element is headquarters reform, military command structure reform, Agencies reform were further examples of adaptations and change to create a leaner, more flexible, allied and cost-efficient alliance where fat is cut to build more muscle and improved tooth-to-tail ratio makes it better able to operate in a context of more diverse security challenges and increasing financial constraints. And let me give you some very concrete examples. The creation of a new division in NATO's headquarters to address emerging security challenges. And here we deal with cyber threats, energy security, and other emerging challenges. But these two are, are the focus uh, right now. Another example, the military command structure has uh, become leaner, has been downsized from about 1,300 and a half to less than 9,000 uh, uh, 9, staff while preserving the alliance level of ambition. And NATO's agency structures has been consolidated from 13 to 3 agencies with a prospect of reduction of 20% in operating cost. With all these changes and transformations, which reflect, which I reflect in a mainly generic manner, NATO is far from becoming obsolete. It remains the core defender of our security in a process of constant adaptation to the evolving security environment. Making an analogy with the IT sector, the fashionable sector of reference when it comes to illustrate adaptability and change, we could not only speak of a NATO reloaded, or, uh, but about an upgraded alliance, a NATO plus, a NATO 2.0, in any case, a higher version of a NATO. And let me uh, give you some um, remarks related to a recent test case of the strategic concept, which was the Libya operation. Uh, operation United Protector in Libya was the first military operation launched since we adopted the strategic concept and the first one uh, as well initiated and executed in the context of the current financial crisis. Let me mention just in a couple of words what this operation highlighted. First, capacity to take unprecedented, quick, consensual political decision to act in the NATO framework just six days after the uh, United Nations Security Council resolution has been passed, which was uh, unprecedented compared to the many month debates in the Kosovo conflict. Second, capacity to assume a mission which falls under a crisis management task. Third, the unique value of the standing command structure of NATO, which is not replicated by any other organization. Fourth, the importance of modern adaptive capabilities. Fifth, the importance of allied solidarity. And sixth, last but not least, the special value of NATO regional partnerships. Despite these challenges, the Operation Unified Protector was a su uh, success for the Alliance as regards the political decision making and operation planning process, its execution, and final outcome. At the same time, this operation demonstrated the need for the Alliance to acquire appropriate early warning mechanisms as well as sufficient intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. Without them, the efficiency of every hard power tools could not be put to their full use. It also underscored the key role of partners in such operations. Now, my third main point, the way ahead. Developing new policies and appropriate capabilities to meet 
New security challenges according to the new strategic concept approved by the heads of state and government last year is the generic responsibility on our way ahead for the coming years. Let me mention some of the key directions of action in this sense. And they are relevant for the upcoming Chicago summit, NATO summit in Chicago that will take place next year in May. Uh, again, number one, here developing a NATO missile defense system. One of the main deliverables envisaged for the Chicago summit is that of declaring the interim capability of a NATO MD system. As you all know, uh, the US has uh, launched its paid adaptive uh, approach on missile defense and has concluded bilateral agreements with Poland, Romania and Turkey as key European partners in this project. At the same time, the US and its bilateral partners in this project expressed their desire and interest to offer uh, their contributions through the paid adaptive approach as contributions to NATO's integrated missile defense system. In the meantime, countries like Spain or Netherlands have announced their interest to bring uh, their contributions and assets. And there are a number of countries that benefit from the so-called um, LTBMD, the alternate layer theater missile like the ballistic defense system, so systems that have been created to defend troops in operations to be put to good use to NATO's territorial missile defense. Second uh, main direction of action is uh, the review of NATO's defense and deterrence posture. The outcome of this process should be that of finding the, finding the appropriate mix between conventional, nuclear, and uh, um, missile defense capabilities as part of alliance tools to def defend and deter threats. Third point, developing the allied defense capabilities against cyber threats. First and foremost, for NATO's own communication information systems, but also develop procedures and capabilities to support, for, to support national critical uh, communication and information infrastructure. Fourth, enhancing and adapting NATO's partnership policies and instruments are another key part of the way ahead. The partnerships, I would say, are the uh, third most important evolution of NATO after enlargement and out of area operations. They are instruments of both soft power, because they bring countries from all over the world closer to the alliance, and uh, they are tools of interoperability with such partners. But they are also hard power instruments, because such partners can become uh, great assets in operations like Afghanistan or Kosovo or Libya. Fifth, ensuring enough resources to meet the challenges is extremely important. In a speech at the Security and Defense Agenda in Brussels on June 10th this year, former Defense Secretary uh, Robert Gates underlined the risk posed by underfunding and by the gap in terms of defense allocations between the US and the European allies. Ensuring an appropriate level of defense allocations is, of course, challenged by the current crisis. And this is an important challenge. After all, one cannot just advocate for increased defense spending and argue against sound fiscal policy since uh, we are agreed that sound and consistent fiscal policies are also sound security policies. But a crisis like this is also an incentive to find innovative means to minimize its negative impact. Smart defense, a concept launched by NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen, is an answer in this direction. Building security for less money by pooling capability together through multinational cooperation. This could be an essential part of the way ahead. We have already good examples of doing this at NATO level. The AWACS program, which ensures the surveillance of airspace and has been critical in operations like Afghanistan or that Libya, the Strategic Airlift Consortium, and also Allied Ground Surveillance, AGS and Missile Defense are programs that are to be accomplished in the same spirit. But let me emphasize, in order for smart defense to work, our output in terms of capability has to be indeed smart. 
but at the same time, the input in terms of invested resources, resources has to be real. After making this generic point on ATO's uh, enduring relevance in the 21st century, allow me to try to take an imaginary step down from this stage and uh, sit among you in the audience and ask some questions from the American perspective. What does NATO represent for the United States? Was it just a Cold War necessity? Is it a cumbersome and expensive luxury on our day? Would it be simple, simpler for the US to go alone in terms of security interests? I think there are some straightforward comments and rhetoric points to make to these questions. NATO was indeed born out of cold, a Cold War necessity context, but is no less of a necessity today. In the context of a complex, interconnected and interdependent world, with so many of the old and new security challenges, it becomes unacceptably costly, even for a power like the United States to go alone on issues related to national and international security. Given the USA interest and responsibilities in terms of international security in such a complex, unpredictable, multi-challenge international landscape, the go-it-alone option is frankly difficult to envisage. How could the United States promote its leadership and interests in responding to new security challenges such as ballistic missile threats or cyber threats if it would not benefit from cooperation of its key allies. What about the alliance's political role and the power of its values and solidarity? Its increasing soft power, I would call. What about the opportunity to use much more the increasing relevance of NATO's soft power through partnerships and its cooperative security dimension? To make it simple and illustrate where we are as allies, allow me to make use of a very short series of very simple questions and answers. Do we need to keep our alliance in a permanent adaptation and transformation process to better respond to our security needs? Yes. Do we need to invest more in our capabilities? Clearly. Do we need to improve, improve burden sharing? Absolutely. But can, we, but can any of us address security responsibilities alone? By no means. The obvious implication of these series of questions is that NATO remains the ever-relevant political and military platform to safeguard our security needs and responsibilities in the 21st century. And let me conclude. The responsibility for security of its citizens is at the core of every nation's set of responsibilities. Security might not come cheap, but the consequences of insecurity become a much are sometimes incalculable price. Security and freedom are indeed priceless. And there's no better way to assure them than within a tested alliance of values, of common purpose, of solidarity and strength, a vivid transformed alliance to address 21st century challenges. I thank you very much for your